Ryu Boo and the Giant Laser, with Aizen Erjan Alp and Barbara Lavina. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Uh, this week we explore one of the most interesting asteroids known, Ryuku. Uh, the Hoyoposa 2 spacecraft recently collected samples from this mysterious object, bringing fragments of the rocky body to Earth in December of 2020. Uh, Ryugu could help researchers uncover the mysteries of the early solar system as examination shows this asteroid was likely born when our planets were still in their infancies. Now the makeup of Ryugu is similar to breccia rocks, a type of sedimentary stone formed on Earth. Uh, when piles of various types of rocks merge together. Now this ancient asteroid likely formed from the breakup of a larger body long ago in the earliest days of our solar system. Rotating quickly, this intriguing asteroid developed a bulge near its equator, giving Ryuku a faceted shape similar to a loose diamond. Now, Ryuku stretches about 850 kilometers in diameter, but this is not a solid body. Around half the volume taken up by Ryuku is empty space. Astronomers have spotted over 4,400 boulders on the surface of Ryuku together with nearly 80 craters. Dozens of surface features named after characters and places from children's stories have been officially recognized by the International Astronomical Union. They're the people who actually name stuff in space. Now, analysis of material from Hayabusa 2 reveals the presence of 20 forms of amino acids, one of the building blocks of life. Now, this doesn't mean there are rock creatures living inside of Ryoku. There's no such thing! Yeah. But this finding is a remarkable reminder of the prevalence of complex organic materials throughout the cosmos. This asteroid is rich in phyllosilicates, which form mica-like structures, as well as carbonates, uh, salts formed by carbonic acid like those found in carbonated beverages. It's swell. Now, discovered in May of 1999, Ryugu looks like a rubber ball stretched over a three-dimensional diamond. Formed just about two million years after the solar system itself began to coalesce, Ryugu orbits the sun at roughly the same distance as the Earth. Next up, we talk with physicist Essen Erjan Elp, Senior Astrophysicist at Argonne National Laboratory, and Barbara Levina, Beamline Scientist from the University of Chicago, as well as Argonne. This pair, along with other researchers, have spent the last year examining samples of this incredible asteroid using, among other tools, a laser 1100 meters across. That is over a thousand times as large as an adult hula hoop. So let's hear about Ryugu and the giant laser. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we have an exciting pair of guests, including Essen Urkan Elk a senior physicist, and Barbara Lavinia, a beamline scientist at the University of Chicago and um, Argonne National Laboratory. And these folks have spent the last year coming up with some fascinating new findings about the asteroid Ryugu. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, First of all, I'm going to start with you, Argon. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your findings and what we've learned about Ryugu? Sure. Thank you for having us. This is our second opportunity to be on your show. Yeah. And, uh, it's great having so, you back. 
yeah. Uh, if you remember uh, from our last conversation, uh, Hayabusa 2 mission has been launched around 2014 to land on a asteroid piece called uh, Ryugu mm -hmm. and bring back some samples so that we can put our hands on it. And the mission was uh, carried out in February 2019 and about uh, a year it took to get the samples the way they like it. And then at the end of 2020, the probe landed in somewhere in Australian deserts. Mm. And the samples were then collected to Japan, uh, cataloged, curated, and then analyzed. Naturally, there were a lot of interest in these samples, so they formed teams, and we were part of the STONE team. STONE team main purpose was uh, to find out where and when the asteroid formed in much part of the solar system, and what is the original mineralogy, chemical composition, and physical composition, physical properties. And from this information obtained, how can we reconstruct the evolution of the parent body and why did it break up or what happened? When did it break up? Mm -hmm. so, so there were definitive questions at the beginning. And in order to, to answer those questions, they had to carry out uh, dozens of uh, different techniques. The total amount of material that came was about 5.6 grams, two thirds of which was curated for the future. And the remaining two grams has been distributed around the world uh, to several synchrotron radiation sources like us. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to join the team because we have a very specific spectroscopic tool called MESPAR spectroscopy, which we can carry out in the lab as well as in the synchrotron. We are unique in that sense. So two years prior to the arrival of the Hayabusa uh, mission, we requested some unknown samples from Japan to show that we can work, work with microscopic samples. And also with our French collaborators, we were able to obtain some special meteorites called CI meteorites. Mm -hmm. These are called Ivuna type uh, meteorites. Uh, Ivuna is a, is a place in Tanzania where a, a meteorite formed uh, in, it fell in 1936. The, what is special about the Ivuna type meteorites is that there are only four or five of them in the world. Uh, they are not very common. And we didn't know until the Ryugu samples were analyzed, we didn't know why they were not that many. It turns out that Ryugu was so porous and so soft that it would not survive entry to atmosphere. So there are only very few of them in the world. So uh, with, with that, we were relatively well prepared, I would say, maybe Barbara will agree with me on that, that we, we, we had a good idea how to start. The samples arrived in very pristine conditions, sealed in nitrogen packages, in, uh, and um, we analyzed. We analyzed, we tried to understand our results. We communicated them to Japan, Japanese colleagues as well as our French colleagues. We are still in the midst of analysis, I would say. Our initial analysis results were published in Science last week. We were part of that team. But uh, we did find out some interesting uh, uh, things like um, presence of sulfides, which is not very common in the other CI chondrites, uh, like Orgil, where we looked at uh, the Orgil meteorite. There were no signs of sulfides. Um, Presence of magnetite was important to the stone team because they could say something about the magnetic fields. And um, at the end of the day, uh, stone team reached some strong conclusions. Uh, and these conclusions were, were, were able to go through a refereeing process. And the findings and the conclusions seem to be consistent enough to be published. That's great. And that leads right into you, Barbara, given your knowledge of geology. Can you tell us like what excited you most about your findings and, and what sure. makes this rock so magic? 
<laughs> <laughs> yes. First of all, it is truly magic to hold in your hand something that made that journey. It is very unique because um, 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 it is unique among the unique, right? Meteorites of that kind are already unique. They come on the, uh, from the sky and occasionally we find one of that type, which is the type that tells you, tells us a little bit more about uh, the solar system before processes like earth formation occurred. Not only it's special, but it's special because it was harvested on the surface of, of, a, of a body. So, and, and was very carefully taken over here. So it didn't go through the rough, rough experience of, of uh, traveling through the earth atmosphere and, and maybe being shocked on impact. So it is well preserved. That's why the Japanese um, space agency, you know, did, did did this work, which is extremely expensive, extremely sophisticated. So um, to me, one of the most interesting thing is the how this piece of rock is in a way unassuming. It is a tiny speck. Uh, dark gray, it could look like a speck of, you know, um, uh, of burned thing from your kitchen. Um, it can be cut with a knife, which is quite unusual for rocks that we are used to. So it is, but, it, you know, it's not your, you know, colorful, some, some rocks are really beautiful to see. So in a way it doesn't have, you know, it's unassuming that way. And even the object that comes from Ryogu is only a kilometer uh, in size, right? Uh, 3000 feet is nothing like, uh, you know, big, big planets or Mars or anything. And it's called a rubble pile. So it, uh, it is <laughs> this collection of pieces with boulders on, on the surface. But then once uh, the team look at it, um, the information is staggering. You have information that comes from few millions of years after the, the uh, solar system formation uh, from uh, more recent times, <laughs> that uh, time scale from quite close to the sun to really quite far away. So uh, it is important to understand we make one type of measurement, which is uh, um, uh, one piece of the puzzle. So this is was quite impressive as an array of techniques. And one of the most interesting finding was this um, crystal that acted like a, a time space travel jar. Uh, so one tiny crystal had uh, an inclusion with water and, and um, CO2 uh, mixed together, uh, which marks uh, the position uh, at the formation of that crystal at about three to four astronomic units at least from the sun, so far away uh, from where the object is right now. So these are some of the <laughs> very intriguing things. That's it's so interesting. I love that you can slice this stuff with a knife. That's <laughs> <laughs> interesting fact of the day right there. <laughs> So I'd like to um, get both of your insights on this. Now you use the Advanced Photon Source or APS at Argonne, a giant laser to shoot into this thing. What where, where were some of the, what did that, what, did, how, what information did that bring about? Why was it used? What makes it such a great tool? Uh, maybe I can tackle that first, Barbara. Um, APS, as you have mentioned, is a one giant X-ray source. The, the bigger the source, the smaller the objects we can look at. So it seems like they are inversely proportional to each other. So our machine is about 1.1 kilometer across, uh, I'm sorry, around. And uh, we are about 60, 70 groups working at the same time around the ring. So it's a multidisciplinary, multi 
purpose facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the 60 beam lines is something called Meshbar spectroscopy or nuclear resonance beam line. As you know, the probes uh, that look into atomic uh, scale is enormous than the, the range of the probes we can bring in uh, X-ray spectroscopy, uh, which is very wide and very well developed. So we are one of those spectroscopic methods where we look at iron in a very unique way. We can mm -hmm. determine its magnetism, we can determine its valence, we can determine its composition. So that's what we advertise to Japanese colleagues saying that we are the best team in the world to look at, let us look at it. And sure, there were, we have uh, competitors or collaborators around the world, and they are also very good, but we happen to be working with meteorites for quite an extensive period of time. So we had some experience. Um, what, what unique things we learned uh, from that the stone team could use was uh, quantification of the magnetite and, and pyrotite. These two minerals are abundant um, in the Ryugu samples. Even though the rocks were very soft, as Barbara had mentioned, that can be cut with a knife, that's because the water inside the pockets were evaporated at some point and left behind a very porous medium. But the minerals themselves are not much different than the magnetite we are familiar with or pyrotite, which is an iron sulfide we are familiar with. In addition, we found some clay minerals. So our struggle has always been to quantify these in a reliable way. And uh, we are still not com completely confident that we have solved every piece of the puzzle, but at least we provided the key information on the presence of magnetite and pyrotite so that uh, measurements done with electron holography could determine the origin of the magnetic remnant magnetic field. And that information was important because it proved that the parent body of the Ryugu was formed in the outer solar system beyond Jupiter because it has something to do with the temperature of the formation. So the presence of water as well as the remnant magnetization were clues that uh, about the origin of uh, formation of the Ryugu's parent body. So, so the, you, you, you go from a tiny speckle as, as Barbara tried to describe um, to a solar system in, in one night, which is quite exciting. That's so interesting. We can you add to that, Barbara. Does it teach us about the early solar system and about the history of yeah of Rio Grande, that fascinating Geelong yeah. journey? <laughs> yes. So um, iron in rocks, in the vast majority of rocks, is it's a quite a special element because it, it is very sensitive to basically the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. And um, to understand that, you can think about uh, the experience that some of the audience might have of purchasing a car. Uh, if it is a used car, you might wanna go and see whether the, there are rust spots around, mm -hmm. right? That rust spot tells you whether the car was driven in Chicago or in California or in Arizona. Basically, wh whether that iron that makes part of the steel body of the car experience sometimes of oxygen, salt, temperature conditions. The very same happens with iron within um, each of the components of a rock. The rock is typically made of whole sort of parts. Uh, which are minerals, right? We, we know the, many of them. And each mineral that contains um, iron, it's basically a sort of like an oxygen sensor, a humidity sensor. And so by the, the techniques that we do here, probe each uh, the iron in each of these phases and tells us something obviously in the context of much broader knowledge uh, of, of the response of minerals to these conditions. It tells us, oh, there was this much oxygen, it could be in that conditions and these other conditions. So we learn 
from the relatively low oxidation state. So it's basically not very much rust up these, these Ryogus that there wasn't very much oxygen around. Uh, and so it's much lower than any that the meteorites that are closer. And so this makes a, it a very unique uh, specimen. Uh, and it's and so we learn something about a very specific uh, place of formation about the oxygen con- content and um, gain and loss of oxygen. Right. If I, if I may add something, James, yeah, why we are so unique in iron. Iron, um, 57 isotope of iron, has a very unique nuclear property called a Mesbauer resonance. Mm-hmm. Mesbauer is a Nobel Prize winner in 1961. The effect was discovered in 1958. In 1959, Argonne National Laboratory already have, in, have introduced iron 57 as the best possible isotope for this type of measurements. So Argonne National Laboratory is very famous for doing this kind of work since 1959 in an uninterrupted way in the laboratory as well as at the synchrotron. So we are um, we have a very long history of working with this method, and therefore we, we were qualified to look at these samples with some confidence. That's so fascinating. What, and how fortunate to be able to take part in this for you folks. It must just be... Just must, must yeah. be amazing. Yeah, it, we are very grateful to Tomoki Nakamura, we, who is the uh, professor from Tohoku University, <laughs> that um, you know provided the sample, but also put together, held together this gigantic uh, team of scientists and made this happen. It was a privilege. Great, and finally, and I'd like to start with you, Barbara. Um, what what is next? What is the next thing you want to you want to examine? There's um, always more that we can learn, so we can take it uh, to a, a deeper level, smaller pieces, and and again looking deeper and deeper to unravel uh, things that we have not yet um, um, uncovered, uh, and so each of these phases would eventually be separated physically and we can look um, at, at, uh, at these independently, um, enhancing our resolution. Um, we can combine better um, on the very same grain um, measurements like diffraction that I've done a lot with the spectroscopy and then we start tightening uh, down um, much more narrowly these things um, and, and all of that while uh, the, the giant picture is also uh, being developed by astrophysicists, uh, astronomers and space agencies. So that is the exciting part trying to at the same time look at uh, yet finer details and a bigger picture as well. Thank you so much. You... Uh, if, if I may add something, yeah, James. Of course, yes. There is a possibility that uh, there is a NASA mission that is going on to Osiris um, mission that will bring some samples. So we will certainly try to put our hands on such samples as well. But if I may also add, this type of research that we carry on, uh, let's say Hayabusa rocks, are equally applicable equally applicable to develop new catalysts or new thermoelectric materials. So what we do is very consistent with the mission of the Department of Energy to develop new techniques and new understanding of material properties so that there can be more efficient energy solutions to energy problem. So therefore, um, we, we are, this is not the only thing we do. This is one of the things we do, but since it is such a high level uh, research, we, it pushes our limits as well. So we are quite happy to be involved in such work. And uh, Professor Nakamura, as well as our colleagues in France, Matthew Roscos and Pierre Beck, uh, these are world-class individuals who would be attracted to a place like Advanced Photon Source because of the unique properties. So this type of research um, is very consistent with our main mission. That's 
Fabulous. So very, very interesting. Well, thank you both for being on the show and thank you for coming back on Ergon. Well, you're welcome. I'm happy that Barbara was able to join us this time. Me too. And, and it's always nice to see you, James. Okay. Both, either of you or both of you are welcome back anytime. And thank that, you. Yeah, Thanks. that was Essen Arjun Elp and Barbara Lavina from um, Argonne National Laboratory. Asteroids hold on to some of the oldest pristine material in the solar system. No air, no life, no water there. Not a bit of erosion. Now, asteroids strike the Earth all the time, but these bits of space rock are fried coming through the atmosphere and exposed to ground, air, and water when they land, polluting the original materials in which they're made. Four and a half billion years of chemical cookery ruined in a matter of seconds. Only by sending spacecraft on sample return missions can scientists get pristine collections, however small, of these ancient pieces of the solar system. The Japanese Hoyopusa 2 mission launched on the 3rd of December 2014, arriving at its destination 300 million kilometers from Earth on the 27th of June 2018. Now, once at Ryugu, Hoyopusa 2 deployed a small lander and a pair of rovers on the surface of this mountain in space. On the 22nd of February 2019, the spacecraft fired an impactor into Ryugu, creating an artificial crater and collecting material from beneath the surface of this ancient piece of our solar system. Hoyopusa 2 then set off back home to Earth, carrying its 5.4 grams of precious cargo, about the weight of a teaspoon of water or an American nickel. A similar mission headed by NASA, OSIRIS-REx, collected a sample from the asteroid Bennu in October of 2020. That payload, payload should arrive on Earth in 2023, and NASA and JAXA, the Japanese space agency, have agreed to share samples so everybody gets to get in on the good science. These missions and the crews on the ground examining materials return to Earth for analysis will help us learn more about the ancient solar system, including the formation of planets, including the Earth. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, I hope you did. I'd love it if you could share this show with your friends, family, or heck, even that person you sometimes talk to for a couple minutes here and there at the coffee shop. Yes, them. And let me know what you thought. Please comment, download, share this program anywhere you share the stuff you like. The more the merrier, am I right? Right. Join us next week for the first of a new series as we learn why we explore space. Curing climate change. We'll be talking with Alan Gratz, author of Two Degrees, a new young adult novel from Scholastic Press. Hope to see you starting on Wednesday, 9th of November. Until then, clear skies.